Shalom, shalom, holy friends. Wonderful to see you. Thank you so much for being here. <clears throat> Great to be with you all today for debate number 32 of 40. If you missed any of the previous 31, you can always find them in our VBM learning library, but we're gonna keep going forward. Today, our wonderful debate is between zealousness, zealotry versus tolerance. Zealotry versus tolerance. So we're gonna give you a little poll so you can start out with your vote. Do you believe in fighting for what you believe in? Option number one, I will fight like a zealot to win what is true and just. Option two, tolerance is overrated. I will, I will fight, but I'll fight a little bit more gently. Option number three, I don't believe in fighting, but in peace. I do try to stand up for what I believe in in some gentle ways. Or option four, I believe in absolute tolerance and will almost never take a stand or push back on others. So friends, let's see what you believe here. Do you lean towards peace and tolerance or do you lean towards fighting for what is right or good? Take a few more seconds. This is a hard binary. Of course, there's a middle ground here. Okay, let's see our results. Wow, 0% here self-identify as zealots and 0% here will never take a stand. But 44% say they are fighters, but they fight gently. And 56% say they don't believe in fighting, they believe in peace, but will stand up in very gentle ways. Okay, very interesting. So we are going to explore this theme throughout a few thousand years of Jewish thought, and then we're gonna open the conversation. So here we go. Should we be certain and forceful with our ideas? Steve, I'm thinking of that quote you texted me yesterday. Let me, let me, uh, let me, let me share this, this quote briefly here, uh, if you don't mind. Oscar Wilde, the truth is rarely pure and never simple. The truth is rarely pure and never simple. Very interesting. Should we be certain and forceful with our ideas? Should we be uncertain and unforceful? Should we be somewhere in between? This is a crucial religious and moral question. It's also a question relevant to all who believe in anything passionately beyond the moral and religious, whether theological or political or intellectual in nature. The case for Kina, Kina means zealotry. The case for Kina is very easy to make. It's the story of Pinchas. Here's what we learn about Pinchas in Sefer Bamidbar in the book of Numbers. The Lord spoke to Moshe saying, Pinchas, son of Eleazar, son of Aaron HaKohen, has turned back my, has turned back my wrath, wrath from the Israelites by displaying among them his zealousness for me so that I do not wipe out the Israelite people in my passion. Say, therefore, I grant him my brit shalom, my covenant of peace. It shall be for him and his descendants after him a pact of priesthood for all time, because he was zealous for his God, violently zealous, thus making expiation, atonement for the Israelites. So very interesting. We have this disturbing story where Pinchas sees behavior he doesn't like, and he violently responds to it, and we think that would be condemned, and yet God celebrates his zealotry, his opportunity to react in the moment to what he believes is right. 
Pinchas acts with zealotry upon witnessing an act of moral depravity in his view, and God seemingly rewards him. The Talmud explains this story in Talmud Sanhedrin. What did Pinchas see that led him to arise and take action? Rav says he saw the incident taking place before him, and he remembered the law. He said to Moshe, brother of the father of my father, as Moses was the brother of his grandfather Aaron, did you not teach me this during your descent from Mount Sinai? One who engages in intercourse with a Gentile woman, zealots strike him. Moses said to him, let the one who reads the letter be the parvanka, the agent to fulfill its contents. So very interesting. Today, as we talked about last time, um, you know, interfaith relationships, intermarriage is, is extremely common in America. But in the biblical era, they were called upon to be zealots in opposition uh, to such a matter, as we saw from Pinchas, and Pinchas is celebrated. So there's a fascinating principle found in several places in the Talmud of halakha ve'en morin kein. This is the halakha, but we do not teach it. Right? It's very interesting. This is the law, but we don't teach it. In the case of Pinchas' zeal, this principle may indeed apply. In other words, while his actions were technically correct, we shouldn't necessarily teach others to act accordingly. In fact, the Ben Ishchai wants to limit the application so that we don't seek to emulate this behavior. Here's what the Ben Ishchai, the great um, Sephardic teacher, um, of the 19th century, and Baghdad writes about this. Did you not teach me? Did you not teach me this during your descent from Mount Sinai? That's the version in the Gemara. Teach me and not teach us in the plural. And it seems that only for this one incident, just for me, Pinchas, you taught this law as it was certain from on high that I, Pinchas, would fulfill it. Okay, very interesting. So, you know, it's, when I first became a parent, I felt you can't tell your kids to not do something that you do. That's called hypocrisy. If you do something, you can't tell them to not do it. Okay, I'm, I'm going to disclose to my small group of friends here a bad habit I have. I have a very bad habit, probably my worst habit, although there's, maybe there's some competition there, <laughs> um, that my kids have, have, have noted every time I do, that ever since I was a, a high school athlete, I sometimes spit in the parking lot. I don't know why I do it. There's nothing in my mouth. I just find myself make, make a little spit in the parking lot. I have no idea. I, it's not conscious, but they tell me, why did you just, Abba, why did you spit in the parking lot? I, say, I have no idea. I say, don't spit in the parking lot. They say, but you just spit in the parking lot. So my, my three-year-old walks around spitting in the parking lot. <laughs> so so yeah, I used to think, you know, maybe you shouldn't do anything that you tell others not to do, including your kids. That's, you know, you should be a, try to be a moral exemplar. You shouldn't be a hypocrite. And then I start to say, well, you know, I mean, can't you still articulate things as right and good, even if you can't meet the bar? I mean, shouldn't I tell my kid to, you know, be better than me, you know, and say, look, I'm not doing it right, but do it right. So what do you do? What do you do when you can't meet the bar that you yourself want to set for, for your kids? So anyways, uh, um, if you're ever walking into Target, you see a little spit in the parking lot, you'll forgive me. <laughs> I'm really trying hard. I'm really trying hard to kick it, but it's totally unconscious. I don't know how I picked it up. And, and I was a cross country runner. And as runners, we were just always running, we were spitting or running. I have no idea. So anyways, a little, a little tangent there. So anyways, the Betty Chai is saying, learn from Pinchas, but don't do like Pinchas. Learn that Pinchas did right. So sometimes we can teach something but uh, as right, but not do it. But I'm sure we could all think of more examples in our conversation of things that we would promote as right um, historically that maybe we wouldn't do. I, I can think of a few examples actually, um, uh, but let, let, let's bracket that conversation. Okay, the Natsiv, the, the very special teacher, the Natsiv, which stands for Rabbi Naftali Tzvi Yehuda Berlin, a great thinker of the 19th century of Velaj and Yeshiva, also seeks to limit the application by saying that Pinchas's intentions were only for heaven. That's to say that an action is not only judged by the consequence or by the deed itself, but by the motivations involved. And he had holy intentions. How many today in their own zealotry could claim that? So here's what it says in the Ha'amak Davar, his commentary. 
Because he was zealous for his God, he deserves the covenant of peace, the Brit Shalom. Not only because he, ha he has turned back my wrath through his zealousness, and had he not reached God's wrath, he would not have deserved the covenant of peace. Not so, but rather because he was zealous for his God. Was his anger and wrath only for the sake of heaven? Therefore, he received the covenant of peace. Okay, so it's almost like, uh, you know, your, your child buys you a present that's a really horrible birthday present. It's just a horrible birthday present. But you see in their eyes so much goodness and sweetness. They're so happy to give you this little wrapped present of like, of like shaven cream or toilet paper. Like, like oh, this is like a horrible present. But it, the intentions are so pure and so sweet. You're so happy to receive this present. So too, God might say like, oh, I don't really love this thing you've done, but your intentions are so good. You know, they're so good. And so it's received with love. It's received with love. And so nonetheless, many religious zealots today, like, right, what's like the worst thing you could be is like in our day, a religious zealot, like that, right? So we're kind of trying to nuance this a little bit. Religious zealots today, as well as many other biblical figures, indeed believe that they are acting purely for the sake of heaven and not out of rage and not out of ego and therefore have the license to act. That's precisely what makes it dangerous is that the religious zealot actually thinks they're serving God. How else can we understand the zealotry of Dina's, Dina's brothers who slaughtered the people of Shechem? I'm sure you all remember the story, but just in case, Dina, the daughter of Jacob, is raped. And uh, rather than talk to her, engage her, ask her what she wants, the brothers go and commit a mass atrocity. They go and wipe out the whole town of Shechem. And so on the one hand, their intentions were, you know, to avenge uh, justice you know, to bring dignity back to their people, to protect the dignity of their sister. You know, on the other hand, uh, what, what, what did these, these religious zealots just do? The case for tolerance, on the other hand, so we just said, it's very easy to make a Jewish case for zealotry. We talked about Pinchas. Now, the case for tolerance is also very, not very hard to make. We learn in Proverbs, in Michle, a calm disposition gives bodily health. Passion is rot to the bones, right? So what is Proverbs saying over there? It says, these people of passion, these are not thinkers. These are not people of balance. These are not people of nuance. The people of passion are zealots. These are people who are running all over the place, causing problems. They're, they're living by their emotions rather than their minds, right? Proverbs says, no, no, be of a calm disposition. Slow down calm down, think about what you're doing. Don't let your passions get away from you. We are to master the trait of menucha tanefesh, equanimity, rather than be led astray by our desires and passions. Song of Songs, Shir Hashirim, has even stronger fighting words for extremism. It says over there, let me be a seal upon your heart, like the seal upon your arm, for love is fierce as death. Zealousness is mighty as Sheol. Its darts are darts of fire, a blazing flame. So Sheol is another Hebrew word for hell. Just like Gehenna is purgatory, Sheol is like the underworld of Hades, so to speak. Um, and it says zealousness, Kina, is as mighty as Sheol, right? The devil, so to speak, is the zealot, right? So the Ramban, Nachmanides, not to be mistaken with the Rambam, Maimonides, says in his commentary on the Torah, the only place where we find the language of zealousness, which by the way is the same Hebrew word as jealousy, to be jealous, uh, jealousy and zealousness are both kina, so it's interesting, the, thinking about the, about the root of those two words, is in matters of avodazara, idolatry. And this is so because Israel is the one Hashem consecrated. And if God's people, God's servants turn to other gods, God is jealous, just like a person is envious of a woman when she goes with another one of his servants, when he takes on another master. Uh, and the same language is not so with regards to other nations to whom Hashem gave the heavenly array. Okay, so let's fast forward from the Torah to the Talmud, to see how the rabbis explore this issue of Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, one of the most influential rabbis in the Talmud, 
who can be seen as the quintessential model for living with equanimity. We learn about his religious personality from this story. And if you're interested in Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, here in the notes, I put a number of other sources you can learn about this amazing figure. But here is, here is, um, here is one of the great stories. Ready? The sage is said about Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, the teacher of Rabbi Eliezer, in all his days, he never engaged in idle conversation. And he never, he never walked four cubits without engaging in Torah study and without donning phylactery, which is tefillin. And no person ever preceded him in the study hall. And he never slept in the study hall, neither substantial sleep nor a brief nap. And he never contemplated matters of Torah in alleyways filthy with human excrement, as doing so is a display of contempt for the Torah. And he never left anyone in the study hall and exited. And no person ever found him sitting in silence, i.e. being inactive. Rather, he was always sitting and studying. And only he opened the door for his students, disregarding his own eminent standing. And he never said anything that he did not hear from his teacher. And he never said to his students that the time has arrived to arise and leave the study hall except on Passover eves, when they were obligated to sacrifice the Paschal lamb and Yom Kippur eves, when there was a mitzvah to eat and drink abundantly. And Rabbi Eliezer, his student, accustomed himself to model his conduct after his example. Okay, so this seems like a pretty regular Talmudic explanation, but what's happening here is Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, his greatness is found in his balance, in his consistency, in his calm disposition, in his discipline, in his structure. I know many people, they're totally unpredictable. This day, they're on time. The next day, they're late. This time, this day, they're really focused. The next day, they're in a bad mood. Right? This day they're gonna really exercise. This day they're gonna they're gonna skip it because they don't want to do it. Right? They're totally unpredictable. They, they have no sense of discipline, of order, of structure. I know other people, if they say nine o'clock, they're there at nine o'clock. If, if they say they're gonna they're gonna do this, they're gonna do that. Right? They are going to live with a sense of discipline, of structure, of order. And Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, while there's while there's a case to make for spontaneity, there's a case to make for a person living with passion. Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai is celebrated precisely for his lack of zealotry, precisely for his middle of the road disposition. So we can perhaps learn people's character best in times of crisis. Indeed, we learn a lot about Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. It's gonna become clear soon why, we talk, why we're talking about him. And here is perhaps one of the most famous passages about him. Vespasian of Rome, then said to Rabbi Yochanan Zaka, now we don't know if, if this Roman leader really talked with this great Talmudic sage. It might be rabbinic imagination or it may be historical fact. In any case, the rabbis um, imagine or, or, or tell us that there is this conversation between Vespasian and Rabbi Yochanan and Ben Zakkai. And he says, I will be going to Rome to accept my new position. This is the first century. Rome is burning Jerusalem to the ground. They are putting the Jews into exile mass murdering the Jews, burning down the Beit HaMikdash, the temple. And Vespasian is the one doing it. Rabbi Yochum and Zaka, you're going to talk to this evil man? This is the Hitler of his day. This is the Hitler of his day. So Vespasian says to him, I'm going to go to Rome and accept my new position. And I will send someone else in my place to continue besieging the city and waging war against it. But before I leave, ask something of me that I can give you. I'm going to be your genie. I'm going to be your genie because I like you. I'm going to give you three wishes. Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai said to him, give me Yavne and its sages. One of the most famous lines of the entire Talmud. Give me Yavne. I'll explain that in a moment. And do not destroy it. And spare the dynasty of Rabbi Gamliel. That's, that's his second request. And number three, and do not kill him. Kill them as if they were rebels. And number three, give me doctors to heal Reb Sadok. Reb Tzadok. Reb Yosef read the following verse about him, and some say it was Rabbi Akiva who applied the verse to Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. I am the Lord who turns wise men backward and makes their knowledge foolish, as he should have said to him, to leave the Jews alone in this time. Oh, so immediately Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai is critiqued in the very passage that makes him famous. They say, what should he have said? He, he has the Hitler of his day 
He has his attention and he's killing everyone and exiling everyone and burning everyone's homes down, destroying the Beit HaMikdash, the temple. This was everything to the Jews. There was no other special place. The temple was the only place. And the rabbis say, you should have said, stop it. Stop it. You've done enough. Let us go. But he didn't do that. He said, give me the city of Yavne. Save Raman Gamliel and heal Rab Sadok. What in the world kind of request is this? You've got the main leader of the world who's destroying your people and that's what you asked for? Now, it's important to know at this very same time, we're going to go to this. We're going to go to this. Just like the, in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, there were Jews in the Holocaust who fought back. There is no critique to be given to Jews who did not fight back. We are in no position to critique those who, for whatever reason, were not able to fight back. But we can also understand why Jews, like in the Warsaw Ghetto, had no chance of winning, but still fought back. We can understand why they would do that for their own pride for their own sake of dignity, why they would eat, not just lay down like sheep, which is not saying that anybody who did not fight back was just laying down like sheep, of course, it's not a fair critique. So we will see in this first century, the first century common era, Jews who fought the Romans, the Bar Kokhba revolts, we're gonna come back to that. We see Jews who were pacifists. And then we see Rabbi Yochum and Zakai, he's got this opportunity. And what they're saying is you should have asked for everything, but he knew he couldn't get everything. So he asked for what he could get, what he believed he could get. Now maybe he was wrong. Maybe he could have got everything, but he could have got bubkis, right? If you had the option of, of, of having a lottery ticket where you're gonna win a million dollars or you're gonna win zero, there's actually a ton of interesting psychology studies about this. You could have a lottery ticket where you've got a good chance of winning a million. Let's say it's a, it's a, it's a rare contest or getting bubkis, you get zero. Or you have the opportunity of an easy two hundred dollars free. What? Wh which would you take? You've got let's say let's say you have a, a one in a hundred chance you're going to get the million dollars, and ninety nine percent chance you got bubkis, or you've got a guaranteed two hundred fifty dollars. So there's a ton of interesting psychology state um, uh, uh, experiments on what people are going to do. So Rabbi Yochanan Ben Zakkai had to make a bet, and his bet was if I ask for too much, even slightly too much, this guy is either going to kick me out or kill me, or go even worse. I got to get what I'm going to get. And what he did in this moment was invented Judaism. I know this sounds radical. He invented Judaism as we know it. Priestly Judaism was destroyed. The temple was destroyed. The, off, the, the, korban, the, the animal offerings, the animal sacrifices, that model was gone. And what he did was he founded intellectual Judaism. He founded the Talmudic Academy. He asked for Yavne and the sages. He founded the Talmud and the Talmud invented Judaism as, as we know it. The synagogue, the prayer, the ritual, the holidays in the formations, we know it. And so Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai is either a sellout that had the audience of, of Vespasian and didn't save his people, or he is the hero who understood balance. He understood he couldn't be a zealot. He understood he needed a middle road and he got what he could get. And boy, was it a lot. And the Jewish people might not be alive today at all for, if it wasn't for Rabban Yochum ben Zaka. Okay, this was a scary time. Virtually everything was destroyed. The temple burned down and Jews were murdered and exiled. Rabban Yochum ben Zakkai almost miraculously now has an audience with the villain Vespasian and he is in a position to make requests instead of fighting, which we're gonna explore next or pushing back or making major demands, he requests to keep Judaism alive through study and learning. Now we see this political debate happening today too, right? I will, if, right for, now I, I'm not offering a critique here. There are, there are um, centrists who will crash and burn a whole policy unless it has a centrist orientation. There are progressives who will crash and burn a whole policy, unless it meets the, the ideological purity they want, right? And so there are people who say, I want it all or nothing. If I don't get everything I want, the whole thing's going down. I don't care how many people are hurt. This has got to be exactly right because I'm a principled person. I want all my principles intact. And then there's the Rabbi Yochanan Ben Zakkai who says, wait a minute, wait a minute. 
we got to make progress and progress is slow and we got to get some wins. We can't get everything we want. And I understand you want, you, you might sound really righteous in the, in the streets screaming for everything you want, but people are going to die that way. A whole lot of people are going to die that way. And those people are going to yell back at him. You sell out. You sell out. You told the people you would stand for them. And that means all the people. We stand for everything. Every dollar, every person. We want everything. And both of them are going to give their strongest arguments to each other. So consider the reply of one with zealotry. On the other hand, this is a very long passage. None of you have ever seen this before um, because it's very, it's, it's very rarely ever been seen. It's from Midrash Echarabah. Midrash Echarabah. And this is the story, friends, about Bar Kokhba revolts. When the Romans are sacking Jerusalem, there was a Jewish uprising. And this is going to be a little bit wordy, but I'll try to, I'll try, I'll try to say it quickly. Rabbi Yochanan said 80,000 pairs of horn blowers were sent to siege on Beitar. And each of them was in charge of a number of troops. And there was the Ben Kozba, as I wrote down on the bottom, also pronounced Koziba or Bar Kochba, Bar Kochba. And he had 2,000, excuse me, 200 soldiers of chopped fingers. The sages sent for him and said to him, how much longer will you continue to mutilate the people of Israel? They said, why are you fighting? You can't stop the Romans. You're killing Jewish people. By trying to fight back, you have no chance. He said to them, and how else should I check them? They sent for him and said, anyone who does not tear the cedar out of the Lebanon, do not write it in your list. What was the power of Ben, Ko ben Bar Kokhba? They said, when he went to war, he would catch the bullet stones in his limbs and would kick them back and kill some people. Rabbi, Yo Rabbi Yochanan said, when Rabbi Akiva saw Bar Kokhba, he would say, a star has shone from Jacob. The star of Jacob has shone. This is the Messiah. They thought he was Mashiach, right? Because you, you forget, there's two Mashiachs. There's two messiahs in the Jewish tradition. There's Mashiach ben Yosef and Mashiach ben David. We always talk about Mashiach ben David. Who is that? The messiah of peace. The messiah who comes to the world telling us that there's going to be a peaceful world. But before the, the messiah of peace comes, there's the messiah of violence. The, the Melchamet Gog Magog. There's going to be a war in the world. World War Three. I mean, God willing, it's World War Three and not World War Four, Because that means there's one in between there. <laughs> Right? There's going to be a war of, with Mashiach ben Yosef, and this Messiah is going, to, is going to wage war. That's the zealot. That's the zealot Messiah. And then there's going to be, and then there's going to be the peaceful Messiah. Um, okay, so they think he's Mashiach. They think he's the Messiah. Rabbi Yochanan ben Torta said, Akiva, weeds will rise in your cheeks. Right? You're going to be buried. And still the son of David does not come. For three and a half years, Adrian placed a siege on Betar, and Rabbi Elazar the Modai sat in sackcloth and ashes and prayed and said, Lord of all the worlds, do not sit in judgment today. Do not sit in judgment today. Because he, Adrian, could not conquer Betar. He thought of withdrawing. There was one Kutite with him. He, the Kutite, said to him, to Adrian, long live your spirit. This day, I am causing you to conquer it. But every day, the chicken sits on its sack and on ashes, you cannot conquer it. That Samaritan said what he said and entered the country. He found Rabbi Elazar standing in prayer. He made himself whisper in his ear, but Rabbi Elazar did not feel it. They went and told Bar Kokhba, your uncle wants to hand over the state. He sent for that Samaritan, but he, Bar Kokhba, said to him, what did you tell him? He said, if I tell you, I will reveal the king's secret. And if I do not tell you, you'd kill me. You'd better kill me then. The king kills me, so I will not reveal the kingdom's secret. Nevertheless, he thought about betraying the state. When Rav Elazar finished praying, Bar Kokhba called him. Bar Kokhba said to him, what did this guy tell you? He said to him, I, had, I have not seen this man. Bar Kokhba kicked him and killed him. At the same time, a voice came out and proclaimed, oh, you who fear the idol, who leave the flock shall be destroyed on his arm. And on the eye of his right hand, his dry arm shall dry. And the eye of his right, eye of his right hand shall darken dark. The Holy One, blessed be he, said, you have broken the arm of Israel 
and mark the eye of your days. Therefore, that man, his hand will wither and his eye will dim. Immediately, Beitar was captured and Bar Kokhba was killed. Right? The great revolt of the Jewish people was smashed. They went and brought his head to Adrian. They brought his head on a stick. He said, who killed him? They said, this one soldier. He did not believe them. He said to them, go and bring me his body. They went and brought him his body. And a snake was found on his arch. He said, if God had not killed him, who could have to fulfill what was said? If not, because it disturbs the vineyard and the Lord was betrayed them. Okay, friends. So moving towards a conclusion here. We saw zealotry in the Bible with Pinchas. We saw the opposite of zealotry as we learned it from Proverbs and as we learned it from Ramban. We saw the balance and equanimity from Rabbi Yochan ben Zakkai, who wants to get what he can get. And we saw the revolt as it emerged from Bar Kokhba, who was willing to be incredibly violent in opposition. One might say that the Rabbi Yochan ben Zakkai tradition is followed today by the Haredim, by the ultra-Orthodox population. You might say. And the Bar Kokhba revolts are still playing out today with the proactive, sometimes militant Zionists who are willing to physically fight for freedom, right? What do the Haredim say? We won't join the army. We're not willing to die for this fight. What do, this, what do the religious Zionists in Israel say? We're willing to fight for this land. We're willing to fight for this freedom, for this self-determination. North American Jews who are not asked to fight physically for survival will easily have a different idea of violence and resistance than those required to serve in the army and to enlist their children. Of course, army service should not be equated with zealotry and living in the diaspora should not be equated with being tolerant. It is of course far more complicated than that. But the question remains, should we use violence to protect that which we cherish most? The hawks say yes while the pacifists say no. The Haredi population by and large says no, while the Zionists say yes, at least as it pertains to state building. There is naturally a correlation between believing strongly in something and being willing to fight for it. A religious person is often more likely to be zealous. A relativist is perhaps less likely. So to conclude, any value held in its extreme can be very dangerous, as we have learned from religious zealots, such as Baruch Goldstein, who committed the, he the Hebron massacre, and Yigal Amir, who assassinated Yitzhak Rabin. So too, to be a relativist who won't fight for anything at all leads to being silent and passive when facing evil. So while the debate of Bar Kochva versus Rabbi Yochanan ben Zaka between the Haredim and the Zionists, between Pinchas and the masses lives on, we must learn when to stand up, how to stand up, how to be passionate about our values, but also to show resistance and restraint. Okay, friends, I'm gonna pause there. I would love to hear from you and some of your thoughts today. Don't forget to unmute yourselves. Hi. <clears throat> Hello. Hello. Uh, would activism today, is that would be, could, is that kind of the modern day zealotry with a twist? Mm. I mean, it's still standing up for what you're fighting for and actually doing something about it, but without, you know, vi necessarily violence or anything like that. So, okay, awesome. Speaking to the activist here, so. <laughs> Thank you, Cheryl, for that, that great question. So, you know, so what, do you, so what exactly is zealotry? Cheryl's asking a wonderful question. So there's a different word we would use sometimes called impulsive. Impulsive means someone acts quickly on their desires rather than having restraint 
upon their desires. So how is being impulsive different than being zealous? I think the difference is, and tell me if you see it different, is that zealotry is acting upon ideology rather than personal desire. So if I want a piece of cake, I don't think for a moment, I just take a bite of cake. That's impulsive. If I tell someone I think they're, they're uh, I don't like their nose, I don't think, is this a nice thing to say? I don't like your nose. I just say, I don't like your nose. That's impulsive, right? That's not a zealot. The zealot is someone who has an ideology of the world and is willing to act impulsively upon, upon that ideology. Now, it's not only impulsive. It can also be not impulsive. This person may have a political strategy and they may have planned it out for, for months. And they are a zealot without being impulsive because they are acting extremely upon their ideology um, in, the, in the public realm. Now, the public realm is a crucial thing. Someone who does um, acts like this in the private realm might be a jerk, but they wouldn't exactly be a zealot. A zealot is someone who operates in the public sphere. So Cheryl's question is a great one. So let me ask this. Maybe you, I don't think any of you, but maybe you or someone you know is a diehard sports fan, right? There is a team, they literally live and die by them. I mean, I, I, I can't relate to this. No offense to anyone else, but someone who like, they cry when their team loses. They throw things at the screen. Like they like, like had they lived in a previous era, they would have been like a soldier and like is all about their nationalist identity, but they live in 21st century America. So instead of being some, you know, radical soldier, instead they're like all about the Chicago Bears. Like everything is about like the New York Knicks, right? Or these days, the Cardinals. I mean, the Cardinals, it's, it's something to talk about, <laughs> right? So they are like, so is this a zealot? Is this a zealot? Someone who like is like, they literally lose friends over it. Like remember how uh, like if you're, if you're a liberal or you're a Trumper, like you break off your friendship. Like people couldn't maintain these friendships anymore. It's like, oh, the divides are too strong. We can't talk to each anybody anymore. Like so too, like it's like that. You're a Bears fan. Like I'm not. I'm, it's not a joke. I'm not your friend anymore. Like I, like I'm not your friend. I, I, I can't relate to it. But there's people like this in the world. No offense. No offense to them. Okay. So is that a zealot? Is that a zealot? Someone who is so committed to their sports team that. Um, uh, so we wouldn't call that a zealot, even if they're going to like be full of rage when their team loses or euphoria, like all of their inner disposition is connected to how their team plays. But let's, so let's go to the activists or, the, or in, in, in the, 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 the political activists. So what, what is the differentiation between a zealot activist and a, um, and a more measured, a more measured activist? So the, the most, the most popular way to, to show that, um, that contrast um, uh, would be between, um, well, first of all, it's easy to call the person on the side you don't like a zealot, right? It's harder to call someone on your side a zealot. But the easiest contrast was Martin Luther King versus Malcolm X, right? Martin Luther King um, was very fervent, very fervent, but he, pro he preached nonviolent resistance. Right, Malcolm X uh, promoted violence. Now he had some shifts. He was a very complicated figure, and he was in the news recently. I'm sure you've seen some things in the news recently. Both of his daughter dying uh, a month ago. Malcolm X's daughter died, uh, and also the guys who were falsely imprisoned for killing him. So there's been some interesting Malcolm X news recently, and some reframing of his narrative in life and his assassination. But Malcolm X promoted violence. Now some say MLK appreciated to some degree the role that violence played in the resistance, even though he promoted non, non but we could bracket that. Let's take it on the Jewish side. In the formation of the state of Israel, there were Jews who were part of, of defense forces. Then there were Jewish terrorists. I know that that feels like a complicated phrase to use, but, there were, but a terrorist is, is clear. Someone who bombs innocent people um, for their cause is a terrorist. Right? If you bomb the army, that's called warfare, right? Um, but if you bomb the innocent people in a hotel or you bomb a whole ship of people, so at, at that crucial time, they were Jewish. Now, some people say, we, we wouldn't have won. We, we wouldn't have won. We wouldn't have survived without that. Okay, but nonetheless, so one measure of zealotry 
has to do with, do you engage in violence or nonviolence? But I think it goes beyond that. I think it goes beyond that towards, um, towards two other factors. One is, are you a pragmatist? Meaning, do you want incremental wins or do you basically want everything, not incremental wins? If you are a preacher of the ideals and you never want to be called a sellout or a moderate, then you can be a zealot because you are not willing to take every anything but everything, right? Okay. Now that's not me. That's not me saying that approach is wrong. I'm just saying that is one approach, um, uh, as opposed to the one who says we need incremental change. The other and the other model I would say is, and I and I can detect this quickly in terms of who I'll work with and who I won't. Um, uh, those who are very planned are very planned and measured with, with calm. And those who um, ha, um, don't contain their rage, those who don't contain their rage or don't stick to the plan, they're not able to stick to the plan. Um, and you now, if you're in a moment of civil disobedience or you are in a moment of high stakes uh, affair, like when I was, uh, I remember being in the streets of Fe downtown Phoenix uh, for uh, thousands of people at a Black Lives Matter. And, and I remember standing right in between the very young Black activists in their early 20s and a line of police officers. And while I was clearly on um, marching with the Black Lives Matter activists, I'm, I'm most certainly not anti-cop. Cop. Um, and so I am pro-cop and I'm most certainly anti-racist and um, pro-Black Lives Matter. And so I was standing there in the middle as wanting to be a person of maintaining order, clearly standing with the activists, but also aware that some of these people I don't know may operate with rage. And what happens in that moment if, there, if one of those activists is a zealot, if one of those activists does throw something, right, uh, does throw something. Now, I just saw a, a new rule in Israel is that when a Palestinian throws rocks at soldiers, the police are allowed to shoot back. Now we can bracket what we think uh, of that approach. Ma many of us may uh, um, support that, many of us may not. And I'm not aware of what the Arizona or the federal laws are around, when you can shoot, when, when like what threat is deemed enough to shoot, what not. You saw the big decision in court uh, this last week around the officer who shot who shot the uh, Dwayne Wright um, who at a, at a red light or stop sign, whatever the case was. Um, so sometimes it, you can be very anxious joining an activist coalition when you don't have trust in place. You don't know how people operate. When you have a coalition, there's trust. You know how you operate. When there are par partners that you don't know, could somebody act with zealotry that could lead something to violence? And all of a sudden, you are a part of the group. Um, you are now associated with that zealotry group. You are now in a violent scene and a part of the group that was, was violent. And so there's a huge risk to joining, especially rallies that emerge in a state of rage. Um, when, there was, when there was police brutality and there were deaths of innocent black men um, and people hit the streets in rage, I wanted to be in the streets with them understanding that rage. But I was also afraid of that rage um, as it leads to um, towards mass demonstration because in mass demonstration, um, a lot of things can happen. A lot of things can happen. And so, um, so, to answer, so to get back to Cheryl's point, I view a crucial part of my spiritual activism is the spiritual work, which ensures that in the most tense moments, you have total clarity. That's what Moshe does in front of Pharaoh. Moshe is in the most tense moments, standing in front of the leader of the world of Paro, and he tells him, you're getting plagues. He tells him that he's going to bring plagues upon Paro, and he stands there calmly. And the Midrash says, all the people are next to Moses as he walks forward. But with every step Moshe takes closer to Pharaoh, the people drop back. By the end, he looks around and he's standing there alone. And I've had many moments like that where you get closer and closer and you finally get there and you're standing alone. There's nobody there with you anymore. And do you have the clarity to still speak truth to power? Do you have the clarity to still say what you need to say? in that moment. And, um, and so, um, uh, and so, however, so here's the last thing I want to say. I'm sorry, this is such a long-winded answer. And then I see we're going to go to Eileen here and then to Jeffrey. 
um, that there's something to say for zealotry um, because we can't just sit with the privilege of saying we're always going to operate from a place of not rage. Like if you have the privilege to not be in a state of rage, that's wonderful. But some people, either because they haven't had the spiritual discipline or because they don't have the, the privilege, the threat is too great. They are immersed in rage. And from that rage will emerge a zealotry. How could it not? Um, because they're literally fighting for their lives. And so I want to be careful that we're never lab labeling the zealotry uh, as, as the enemy. Because I do think there's forms of zealotry which need to be contextualized. The other thing I want to say is that there is a spirit in us. One of the, one of the tragedies of our time is the lack of passion, the lack of something to fight for. And so there is a zealous spirit, that sense of I'm giving my life to this. I mean, I, I mean, nothing against investment bankers. My, I, I was raised in my family. Go be an investment banker. Go make some money. Like, you know, I said, look, I, I, I'm not here for the money. Nothing against going to make money. Like, I, it's wonderful. People want to do it. Like, I'm willing to make the sacrifice to do nonprofit work because I've got a burning fire in me. I've got a burning fire. or something I want to do in the world. And so, so is that zealot, is that zealotry or is that passion? So there is something to um, having such a fire in you that you're willing to make real sacrifices um, on, on many levels. And to be sure, I don't view my work as a sacrifice. It's only, I, I'm only blessed to do what I do. It's not some big sacrifice to do it. But, but, but you know, I mean, but people have said to me along the way, geez, you could have, you could have done this, you could have done that, you know. Um, so anyways, anyways, a lot more to say here. So how do, that's the challenge. How do we keep the passion alive? but also have a deep level of restraint to make sure that we are effective. We are effective and that we're adding more light than fire, adding more light than heat. Yes, Eileen. Uh, oh, okay. Um, it seems to me that in all the reading and discussion from today that the most appealing place to be is one of moderation, where you can still maintain um, a desire to make changes, but to make changes incrementally and to make changes with thought and to make changes with consequences. And when you talk about zealots, my impression is they have no thought to the consequences. They're in the heat of the moment and whatever they do then is fine by them. But as we look at it, it's like they're lacking any restraint they're lacking any intellectual concept of what they're doing. Okay, Eileen, thank you for that. Thank you for that. Now, okay, a few things there before we go on to Jeffrey and whoever else is. Oh, there's two Jeffrey. Sorry, um, Jeffrey Y. Uh, uh, so, um, so there's two things I want to say. There. First of all, one of my teachers, um, Rabbi Avi Weiss, uh, uh, he, he he was a zealot. He was a zealot. And, but he was a pluralist as a zealot, that he supports both sides. So let me, let me flesh that out a little bit. He said, the only reason we won on Soviet Jewry is because of the zealots. We were the ones in the street that were, we could be written off as extremists getting arrested every day, right, in civil disobedience. But the only reason the Jewish establishments eventually got on board, right, and claimed the victory as their own, was because we had pushed them so hard to do it. So his argument is you need moderates and you need extremists. The extremists will make the moderates move. And so the, he says the moderates won't move. The establishment will be slow and passive and content, and they will only move if the extremists make them move. And so he says, we need the moderates. We need the moderates because they have the power of an establishment, right? Um, but uh, the moderates also need us extremists. They're both gonna, uh, they're both gonna um, disavow one another. The extremists are gonna say the moderates don't really get it. They're not. They don't really understand. They don't really care enough. The moderates are gonna say the extremists are radicals. But he argues they both need each other, and so um, it's an interesting, 
case to make, even though he had a particular approach that he took. And so that may actually be true. And if we look at, at the history of causes um, and we look at the relationship between the zealots and the moderates, I think we would see um, uh, they're playing off each other. Uh, so yes, Jeffrey, why? So I'm concerned with what I feel is a large majority of people nowadays, uh, a subclass below the moderates. Uh, the, the um, oh, what do I, I just had it in my head. The skeptics, the skeptics who see an argument and say, I'm disgusted, I give up, walk away. It's not that they have a moderate point of view. They have a very strong point of view, but they're just disgusted by the whole thing. And, um, you know, that, that clearly includes me. I'm now living in Texas and retired and disabled. Um, but uh, anyway, I just wanted to hear your thoughts on, on skepticism. Okay, great, great. Jeffrey, so thank you for that. Thank you for that. You know, um, Bill Gates, and then Eric, I see, your, I see your hand up. Bill Gates wrote a blog post this week where he said the greatest threat in 2022, at least, at least this was my read of it, um, but it's worth reading it itself for your own read on it. The greatest threat in Bill Gates's view is the disbelief in government. Mm -hmm. What he said was, um, what he said was, the, a trust in government is so necessary for, for public health protocol and other collective measures that, um, that we will not be able to achieve um, anything without some people believing public health protocol and the like. As you know, his charity has gone so much to public health. And so he thinks that this disbelief is gonna be at the foundation or the core of the breakdown of American science. Now, he might've said the great problem is COVID, the great problem is poverty, the great problem is the anti-democracy work, but he thinks that if we don't trust government, then we will lose the fundamental collective enterprise that makes anything possible, whether it's democracy, it's public health, it's education, whatever it is, right? So let's bracket Bill Gates whether they agree or not. Now, this skepticism, People on the far left are skeptical. They say, wait a minute, I vote Democrat, but I don't get the stuff I want. What's going on here? People on the far right are, are very distrusting of government. They say, oh, I don't even believe democracy worked. It was a fake election, right? They say, uh, you know, this government is all corrupt. I can't trust any of these mask protocol or these, these, vac these vaccine mandates. I don't so we see it on the far left and we see it on the far right. And we also just see it beyond the far left and far right. People who are just fed up, they're just skeptical of the whole thing. Politicians, it's all about ego, it's all about money, right? You can't really create real change in the system, whatever it is you want. And so um, on the one hand, um, I, I, I understand the skeptic. And to be sure, one of the reasons that I'm a, um, one of the reasons that I'm, a, I'm a, a religious activist or a spiritual activist rather than a politician is because I'm skeptical of politics. I, 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 I think the system itself, the people who want to be a part of it, the people who want to operate within it, I think there's some questions to ask the way our systems operate and the way that change uh, takes place. And so I'd rather be on the outside of the system agitating for change than on the inside of such a system. So I appreciate the skeptics um, who are skeptical of people in elected office or skeptical of the system itself, you know? And at the same time, at the same time, I really believe fundamental to Jewish thought is that we embrace, we embrace the imperfect. We cannot stay in relationships if we only wanna be in relationship with perfect people. We cannot stay at a job if we only want to be at a perfect job. We cannot stay in a religion if we want some kind of perfect religion, right? We can't, we can't create change if we want the process to be perfect. And so I believe fundamental to Judaism is you got to get in the mess. You got to get in the mess. You got to get into messy relationships. You have to be in a messy workplace. You have to be in messy politics because the world is messy. And so while we can be skeptical, the skepticism can't be paralyzing to the extent that we are not still in the mess. 
And so uh, I, I believe it's healthy to be an intellectual skeptic and a skeptic of the system. And I think it's healthy to both hold on to that skepticism and uh, simultaneously continue to try to move things forward. So Jeffrey White, thank you for that great question. Eric, I, um, uh, I think you got the last, last question here, Eric. Thank you very much. Uh, you brought up some great points about the notion of attributes that are being that to be would define a zealot and attributes that will kind of define in the camp of toler of tolerance. My question is when you see certain attributes of being applied in what is when you see attributes from one camp be implied by the other, things that are traditionally like zealots, as you said, physical violence, but and tolerance is more tend to non-physical, non-physical violence, but now it takes one app attributes and definition of one uh, camp to the other. Do you see that that's kind of like the, the notion of attributes and what is defined as, I guess my question is, do you see that evolving in a healthy direction to what is zealot and what is tolerant? If there's kind of a switching of different attributes or they're evolving in that sort of way. Okay, I, I don't think maybe that doesn't make sense, but I, I just like you, maybe just stay, stay at the last part again because I think okay. I get it, but I want to be sure. All right, it, it just like if you took, uh, do you see that what is defined as zealot or what is defined as tolerant? Is that going in a healthy direction? Like mm -hmm. if they're evolving to take different attributes and tactics, tech, uh, tactics, technical procedures, but are being implied by the other camp, or is it? Ah, ah, I see, I see. Okay. Oh, okay. Very interesting. Right, right. So, right. So, you know, Immanuel Kant, the great German philosopher, Immanuel Kant, believed and, um, that we should live by the categorical imperative. And what the categorical imperative meant for Immanuel Kant was that we should only do what we can universalize. That is to say, I should only do, going back to my point about spitting in the street and being, and, you know, the hypocrisy of what we do and what we say we should do. I should only do what I think would be a good world if everyone did it. If everyone did what I'm about to do, this would be a good world, right? And so I can't choose to do something according to Kant that if everyone did it, it would be a problem. I can't make myself an exception to the moral rule, okay? So he says, anytime you're about to make a moral choice, is this a good moral choice or not? One of the tests case should be what would our society look like if everyone did this, okay? So that is part of the question here too. According to my political worldview or my religious worldview, I want people to fight like hell to get, to get a victory, right? But what if my opposition takes the same tactics? And so when it comes to gerrymandering, you know, I want to redistrict, I want to reset the districts, but what if the other party resets the districts? When it comes to filibuster, I don't want, I want the filibuster gone, but do I want it gone for the other party, right? And it goes back and forth, whoever's in power, he wants the filibuster, right? And so, um, so, so, so too here, if I'm on the left, the worst thing you could do is be a part of the January 6th insurrection. The insurrection on, you know, the, an attack on democracy, an attack on the Capitol, a violent insurrection against the police, that's the worst you could do. If I'm on the right, the worst you could do is you could be rallying in the street and looting businesses. You're smashing stores. Now, now to us, the, the comparison may seem absurd, right? But to both sides, like, like, oh, the left is this violent mob that's looting and breaking store windows. And to the left, oh, the right is this undemocratic, like, like insurrectionist mentality, right? It, it, literally nobody can see the inconsistencies and when they're pointing at each other. It's like, so we, it's right. We have to actually set some standards we have to actually set some standards in place when we talk about um, about what what kind of social change procedures we want to promote, and so that we're going to have to say this type of zealotry is healthy passion, really strong healthy passion that has some level of restraint, and this type of zealotry crosses the line and is extremism that has to be rejected by all, and that is an important conversation to have, and in how we think about social change. What tactics are in, what ta tactics are out? Um, when do we call out people in our own camp? There was a case this summer, I wanted to call out a group that we're in coalition with for going too far on something. Um, and it's always a hard case. When do you call out um, potential allies? When do you call out potential allies if you think they're going too far um, or even potential friends? 
and how do we how do we in, um, you know keep each other in check in this regard? Okay, friends, the debate of zealotry versus tolerance is still alive. It is still alive, and I hope you see it alive not only in the world but in um, inside yourself, inside yourself, and how you're experiencing the news, how you experience life, because we don't want to be passionless and not willing to fight for anything. We saw the poll. We saw the poll. None of us want that. But we also don't want to be unrestrained extremists. And so how do we cultivate that middle ground? Our debate next week is around what does every community need? Care for the vulnerable versus education. If you only had a dollar to donate and you could give it towards educating the next generation or care for the vulnerable today, where would you choose to give your dollar? Well, I'm not fundraising in this class, but at VBM, we do both education and care for the vulnerable. So you don't have to make that choice with us. But at your other end of your tax donate, tax donate, you know, tax deductible donations, you might have to decide, do I want to further education or do I want to support the sick, poor, and dying? Have a wonderful day and we'll see you soon. Have a great 2022. God bless.